Good morning. Uh, thank you for joining us for our latest Ontario Medical Association briefing on important healthcare issues in the news. My name is Dr. Andrew Park. I'm the president of the Ontario Medical Association, which represents more than 43,000 doctors. Our topic today is artificial intelligence and its potential for transforming healthcare. Ontario's doctors and researchers are at the forefront of our artificial intelligence, developing tools that will improve patient care and outcomes and make our healthcare system more efficient. We're looking to harness the power of AI to make predictions about which individuals or populations might get certain diseases, to anticipate which, uh, to anticipate which patients will have complications, and to optimize our scarce healthcare resources. AI programs could also lead to much faster research breakthroughs, which in turn leads to better care and outcomes. Artificial intelligence technologies can quickly and accurately analyze patient data, including medical records, genetic information, and lifestyle factors, and identify patterns that doctors might overlook. This allows doctors to make more informed decisions about their diagnosis, including early disease detection when treatment is more effective and less invasive. This not only improves patient outcomes, but also reduces the burden on our healthcare system by preventing the progression of diseases to more advanced stages. AI is also helping us predict complications in hospitalized patients, where AI-powered systems can analyze patient data in real time, flagging potential issues and alerting medical staff when intervention is needed. AI is also helping to better allocate healthcare staff and resources. With the help of AI, we can optimize staff scheduling, ensuring that there are enough healthcare professionals on hand when and where they are needed most. For example, the OMA is de developing an AI tool that will allow us to predict future healthcare human resource needs, such as how many family physicians and specialists will be required in a specific geographic area. I'd now like to introduce our expert panel members who are all working on exciting projects using AI to improve healthcare. Dr. Fahad Razak is an internist at St. Michael's Hospital and the Canada Research Chair in Healthcare Data and Analytics at the University. University of Toronto. He co-founded Gemini, one of Canada's largest hospital data and analytics network. Dr. Amal Verma is a 2023 Temerty Professor in AI Research and Education in Medicine at the University of Toronto. He co-leads the Gemini Project at St. Michael's, where he also practices internal medicine. Dr. Ibakan Abijarindi is a scientist at Women's College Hospital Institute for Health System Solutions and, a vir and, and Virtual Care, and a Solution Network member working on an AI diabetes prediction and prevention project funded by the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. I'm going to hand things over first to Dr. Razak. Dr. Razak, what ways is AI shaping and improving our healthcare system now? Tell us about your project that can predict delirium in hospital patients. Uh, thank you, Dr. Park. It's a pleasure to be here with the OMA and with all of you. Um, this is a really exciting topic. I think for someone who started in medicine as a staff member at St. Michael's around 10 years ago, the promise of what AI can deliver to the system is something that I think has galvanized and excited people more than any other innovation I've seen in the last decade. Um, I think we are just at the starting point of this innovation. So as someone who provides care as a general internist, at St. Michael's, has AI directly influenced a lot of the care I'm providing? Not yet. I think we're going to hear of one really prominent example from Dr. Verma, but by and large, it's not really influenced the way we deliver care at the bedside yet. So a lot of this is potential of the next five years, what we will see. Um, Dr. Park has raised the example of delirium. This is a project where I think we're really starting to potentially shift the needle. So just to give a bit of a preamble, delirium is this incredibly important entity that affects probably 20 to 30% of all hospitalized adult medical patients. So very, very common. It's an acute confusional state. It's probably precipitated by a combination of critical illness, the medications and therapies we provide for people and underlying risk factors. And once it occurs, it's very consequential. So it will double the chance that you will end up in a nursing home, for example. It doubles the risk of dying in a hospital it increases cost of care by on average about $11,000 per patient. So incredibly important entity when it occurs, very, very common. There are many things you can do to prevent it, but it is labor intensive to prevent it. And for example, the typical strategies include a lot of health and human, uh, healthcare human resources, the kind of things that are very constrained already, a lot of nursing resources, a lot of physician resources. And so a really important question in the system right now is this very important entity. If we have the steps to prevent it, 
how do we allocate those out to people who are most at risk? And unfortunately, the current healthcare data that we have access to misses probably about 80% of all cases of delirium. So with partners across Ontario, anchored out of St. Michael's Hospital, but with now partners extending across the province, we've developed an artificial intelligence tool that combs through existing electronic data from within our Gemini platform. Gemini basically covers hospital data that's generated as part of routine care, the lab tests we're sending, the medications, et cetera. It's increased the recognition of delirium from that missing 75% of cases to now a 90% accuracy in capturing where delirium is occurring. So this is a remarkable advance and it allows us now to start to target those resources towards areas which are highest risk. And that is what we are doing practically now. We are working with a network of academic hospitals across the greater Toronto area, helping them understand where delirium is occurring using this AI tool. And the next step now, what we are currently implementing is that intervention to try and reduce the rates of delirium. That's excellent, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> now I'd like to hand things over to Dr. Amol Verma. Dr. Verma, can you tell us about ChartWatch AI tool at St. Michael's Hospital and how you will be mentoring the next generation of physicians and researchers as a new Temerty professor in AI research and education in medicine at the University of Toronto? Yeah, thanks so much, Dr. Park. Uh, you mentioned earlier that one of the advantages or opportunities uh, afforded to us by artificial intelligence technologies is to predict in advance uh, complications that might happen, which gives us a chance to hopefully prevent them. So at St. Michael's Hospital, we developed a tool to do just that. The leading cause of unplanned transfer to an intensive care unit or patients deteriorating in hospital is unrecognized clinical deterioration. So when we as clinicians, whether that be physicians, nurses, other clinicians in a hospital, don't recognize that the person in front of us that we're taking care of is getting sicker. Um, and uh, the colloquial term people use sometimes is, oh, that patient just crashed. They suddenly deteriorated. Well, the question is whether there are some subtle clues or signs that artificial intelligence might be able to detect earlier to alert us to patients who might be deteriorating and provide an early warning system. So we created ChartWatch. ChartWatch is a machine learning based tool. It takes all of the data in an electronic medical record here at St. Michael's Hospital, and every hour generates a new prediction of which patients might deteriorate in the future, might become so sick that they need intensive care or die. And then those predictions are shared with the clinical team as every patient as low, medium, or high risk. And the clinical team can then respond to high-risk patients intervene earlier by prescribing treatments that might prevent the deterioration, importantly by speaking with patients about their wishes, their goals of care. So if they were to deteriorate, would they want intensive care to allow us to improve the sort the values of, of, of care so that it's more concordant with individual patients and families' values? Um, and to then accelerate access to either intensive care if people need or want intensive care, or to palliative end-of-life care if people don't necessarily want that uh, accelerated care, but do, of course, want um, to, to have uh, that process of death occur with dignity and with as little suffering as possible. And so uh, we implemented that chart watch tool actually in about October of 2020, and it's now been functioning for nearly th uh, three years now. Uh, and what we've seen is, uh, compared to the time before we had the tool, on our units uh, where the tool is present, we've seen a 26% reduction in unexpected deaths. And a big part of that improvement is the increased recognition of people who need high quality end of life care. Um, and so we're really excited about that uh, that technology. It's really enabling our day-to-day -day care. Um, and I'll just give you one example of where, you know, uh, one of the things that's critically important is training health professionals in how to use these tools and communicate with patients effectively about these tools. Uh, so in one case, we had a, a patient who was alerted as a very high risk. And uh, uh, the resident physician went to speak with that patient and told the patient, oh, you're, the computer thinks you're at very high risk of, of clinical deterioration. And that induced a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety in that patient, right? And it highlights a gap 
in terms of, so then the patient starts having a million questions. Okay, well, wh why is the computer predicting this? What are you doing with my data? How is this uh, prediction being generated? And, and a clinical resident, you generally would not have the facility, the skills to answer that question. And so part of our implementation is trying to train our, our residents to be able to speak about these technologies. And so this brings me more broadly to your second question related to education. So what are we doing to educate the healthcare workforce? I like to think of the analogy of an MRI machine. So most of us practicing clinicians have no idea how an MRI machine actually works, right? But we know when to use the technology. We we know how to communicate with our patients about its results. We know its strengths and its limitations. Artificial intelligence is a very similar thing. We don't need to train our whole healthcare workforce to understand the intricacies of machine learning, but they need to understand when to use these tools, their drawbacks, and importantly, how to communicate with, with patients about these tools and how to in incorporate them into their own clinical decision making. And so you mentioned I am the, the Temerty Professor of Artificial Intelligence Research and Education in Medicine at the University of Toronto, which is a mouthful. We have a center here called the Temerty Center for AI Research and Education in Medicine. And one of the core aims of that center is delivering educational programming uh, for our uh, medical students and other health professionals. And they're doing a variety of really exciting and, and interesting opportunities there. Um, uh, so the first is just expanding that base foundational knowledge. So we have uh, teaching programs for our undergraduate uh, medical students, for our postgraduate residents now. And the exciting thing about those programs is that they're actually being designed and developed by our current uh, MD, PhD students, by other graduate students in ML. So who really understand what first the cutting edge of this technology, they're like, you know, native to, to this. Um, and then they're also uh, designing it for the needs of that generation, right, of the next generation, which is really exciting. And then there's a sort of wide variety of wraparound programming. There's uh, a conference coming up in, in October, which is really exciting about AI and medicine. Uh, there's monthly uh, speaker series. Um, and there's also, uh, importantly, one of the big gaps in uh educating people about uh, machine learning and AI is access to high quality data. So one of the things that uh, we're doing both at Gemini and at, the, and at the Temerty Center is trying to make data more available to students. So the Temerty Center has something called the Health Data Nexus, which takes data, uh, desensitizes, makes sure everything is private and shares it with, with students and uh, other people for their use. And we're doing the same thing with Gemini. So it's really an exciting uh, area. One really critically exciting and important part of that education is that it's very multidisciplinary. So we're bringing together medical students and other health professional students, but also um, uh, engineers, computer scientists, ethicists, social scientists. And that's what's really excited. We The approach to AI has to be multidisciplinary because as much as we've talked about all of the enthusiastic and optimistic things, there are also very important concerns that need to be addressed with, resp with respect to the safety of these technologies, uh, privacy, uh, ethics, and equity. And so those things are critically important. And I'm excited to hear more from our other panelists today, Dr. Avajarindi, who's really an expert in those areas. Perfect. Thank you for that well-rounded view of kind of what AI uh, can do for us, as well as how we train our, our, our next generation of healthcare professionals in that world. Um, I'd like to hand things over to Dr. Eva Kanabajarindi. Um, Tell us about the project you are working on that can help predict and prevent diabetes, and how can this be applied to other AI projects to predict disease? Thank you so much, Dr. Park. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, so the goal of our solutions network, and this is a three-year project that has been funded by CIFR, is to be able to use AI to predict, plan, and respond more efficiently as a healthcare system to the growing burden of type two diabetes in Canada. And we know that diabetes is a largely preventable issue, type two diabetes that is. And so what our team, which is made up of about six clinician scientists, ethicists, researchers from multiple disciplines um, have come together to do is for the next three years, work within a very locally embedded context to be able to develop a novel framework to inform how can we deploy machine learning models that can then be used to ethically, responsibly, and sustainably plan ahead as a health system and as a society to catch people early, 
So our team members have been involved over the last several years, developing models that can predict up to five years in advance, the likelihood that somebody will be diagnosed with type two diabetes or that they will suffer a complication from it. Those models have been validated. Their performance has been established. It was developed using a large data set. But now that we have done, we're done with that you know, development phase, it now comes to the deployment phase and implementation phase. And there are two major issues that have come up with the use of artificial intelligence in healthcare that our team is hoping to solve. One is this issue of social acceptability, which is something that Dr. Verma has spoken about. There are questions around the implicit bias of AI, questions around the ethics regarding its use, privacy concerns and data breaches, who is benefiting from it? And so our goal is by working very closely in the pure region of Canada with community stakeholders, health system stakeholders and decision makers to really interrogate the questions and concerns that arise with the use of AI in healthcare and to be able to take this information to feed into how we ethically and responsibly develop the models that we have already validated. So that's one problem we're hoping to solve. The second problem has to do with, um, you know, there's documented evidence of the potential and power of AI. There's also documented failures. How do we minimize the harm and escalate or leverage the good and the benefits of artificial intelligence at a very large population level? And so our plan is we're going to develop a framework using a very participatory stakeholder owned and driven approach, working with people within the PO community. And we, we picked this community for a couple of reasons. One is the PO region in Ontario is one of the most diverse in Canada. Over half of the residents identify as being first or second generation immigrants. Up to 62% of residents um, identify as coming from an ethnic minority and there is a very high burden of diabetes. So as a 2015 data was showing that one in 80 people had been diagnosed with diabetes or pre-diabetes. And so we feel like this is a perfect context to do a locally owned case study and to be able to develop this framework. The framework is then gonna feed into a live output whereby decision makers will have a dashboard that would allow them to see who are the highest risk patients, where do they live? What are the chances that patients from this specific communities or with this particular histories are at risk of becoming pre-diabetic or being diagnosed with type two diabetes? And so the goal of that is we want to then use that dashboard that policymakers will have access to and decision makers will have access to, to then inform like a tiered approach. How do we redesign our systems to take a very preventative approach for those who we see coming down the pipeline of being diagnosed with diabetes? How do we redesign systems to be able to do early diagnosis and management as soon as it happens, you know, if we're not able to prevent it from happening? How do we ensure that we're improving the quality of life of those who can get diabetes? So the burden, the data of burden of diabetes shows that in the next seven years, seven to 10 years, we're gonna have 14 million Canadians who are pre-diabetic or have type two diabetes. The net sum of this, what it would mean for our health system from a dollar perspective is about $5 billion. Apart from the cost implications, then there's also the quality of life implications. People who have type two diabetes have a shorter lifetime expectancy of five to 10 years compared to their peers who are non-diabetic. And then there's also the reduced quality of life because the complications of diabetes affect multiple organs like the eyes, the, the kidneys, um, the nerves, the skin. So there are so many other impacts that we're trying to, by deploying this model ethically and responsibly, um, inform decision makers so that they can make the right choice. So the way we're seeing this is, if we have responsible AI that can be deployed sustainably at scale, we'll be able to make better healthcare decisions that will serve the population better. Thank you, Dr. Abergerindi, and thank you to all of our panelists for sharing your expertise. We're now going to open up 
our Q&A session. The OMA's Emily English will moderate this portion of today's briefing. Please put your questions in the Q&A chat. And as always, if we don't get to your questions, the media team will follow up with you. You can also email media at oma.org with requests for interviews or information, and we will have a recording of this session available later this afternoon. Emily? Thank you very much, Dr. Park, and thank you to all our panelists. And a reminder to journalists, you can put questions directly into the chat. Uh, the first question we have is for Dr. Burma. Um, Dr. Burma, can you tell us in 10 years, what are the biggest ways you think medicine might be changed by AI? Yeah, thanks so much for the question. Let me start with the three to five year horizon and some critical low hanging fruit. I'm really excited about the idea that artificial intelligence should in the next three to five years be able to allow our healthcare professionals to dramatically reduce the burden of administrative and IT related workload and save much more time for patient care, for direct face-to-face -face contact with their patients. We have seen over the last 20 years, the rise of electronic medical records in sort of a version one kind of technology that tethers clinicians to a computer screen. And so now when you go see your family doctor, they don't look at you in the eye, they're typing into their EMR, right? And so th the latest generation of language models in artificial intelligence should hopefully be able to get us away from our screens and facing each other again and dramatically reduce the workload burden that, that clinicians spend combing through medical records to find a patient's history and then generating their own records. Most uh, uh, physicians say that the burden of documentation in an electronic medical record takes hours, two to four hours every day. They're spending time at home in their pajamas before bed, finishing all of that work, right? And so our ability to use AI to save that time and bring time back to clinicians and therefore compassion back to the bedside and and that uh, empathetic connection again, I think is one of the most exciting things. The second most exciting thing I will add is that we already have seen diagnostic technologies that are enabled with artificial intelligence that improve our ability to do things like detect cancer uh, by 15 to 20% over current uh, uh, methods with just humans alone. And so I think it's incumbent upon us to incorporate those technologies into things like colonoscopies for screening for colon cancer, breast cancer screening programs, other things like that, that will allow us to detect diseases earlier, prevent diseases and have better outcomes in patients. And so I think we're really going to see those two areas really grow dramatically in the next couple of years, uh, which will, you know, hopefully lead to a much more compassionate, empathetic system, a healthier workforce, a happier workforce, and better outcomes for patients. Thank you very much. And we have a question from Don Johnskew with CHCH in Hamilton. I'm going to direct this one towards Dr. Razik. How secure is a patient's data in hospital? Yeah, this is an important question, and I think it's been a barrier to much of the work that potentially could be done with this kind of health data, which is the very legitimate concerns around protecting this intensely private and important information. Things like the testing that patients get done, the results, frailty, language. There's many things in these records that are that need to be protected. I would say that as any other large data repository, we need to make sure that patients' health data is protected at the absolute highest standards. We think about this the same way we think about financial records, for example, that you have at a bank that is largely digitized and online right now. What I would say is that part of that is a partnership between the researchers, the custodians of this kind of health data, which are hospitals or other healthcare institutions, privacy officers and the public. And we need to have that open dialogue about the best standards of protection. And I believe that Ontario and Canada are very much leading the way in terms of best protections. However, the protections themselves shouldn't be a barrier to using the data to improve people's lives. At the end of the day, all of this is a social compact and it's a trade-off of risk. So let me give an example that I often cite. When you get onto an expressway, you drive in Ontario, the limits on most of our expressways are hundred kilometers per hour. It could be higher. It, it is higher in other parts of the world. It may mean that you get to your destination faster, 
but with increased risk. It could be lower. It may mean that it takes double as amount of time to get to your destination, but with lower risk. And we've come to an agreement about what is a socially acceptable amount of risk, and we've set a speed limit. That conversation largely around data hasn't happened yet. So there is no 100% risk-free way of having this kind of data stored. There's always a risk of people trying to invade your data repositories. There's a risk of disclosure accidentally or otherwise from this kind of data. But we have to come to a social compact where we don't have protections absolutely to the extent that they reduce or eliminate the ability of us to generate benefits for patients, for the healthcare system. I do worry that a lot of our tendency is to focus disproportionately on the risk so that we push that speed limit essentially closer and closer to zero. We say absolute protections, let's not take any risk, let's not look at the benefits. We know that when we open up these data repositories that we're seeing, for example, enormous variations across the province and across the country in access to care, quality of care, cost of care, the outcomes that people have. We wouldn't know that without looking at the data. So to me, we need to talk more about the potential benefits that this data has by being open, by being analyzed, the benefits for patients, the benefits for sustainability of the system. And the complex patient, the complex problems that we're facing in the healthcare system right now disproportionate burden on certain communities, the increased problems with access across the system. A lot of these are things that data can be part of the solution. And so in part of the general discussion around protections, I think we need to be incredibly respectful following best standards, but also not lose sight of the fact that if we continue to clamp down on essentially a strategy that focuses on protection of data disproportionately, we lose the other part of this, which is the benefit to patients. Thank you very much. And Dr. Verma, I believe you had something you'd like to add on to that. Yeah, I think Dr. Razak uh, gave an excellent macro level answer, which I 100% agree with. One smaller point I would add is that in, an incre in a world where our healthcare records are increasingly linked uh, so that they're not just isolated to one primary care practice, let's say, it means that those records are often going to be shared. And I think we as clinicians and even as patients who are accessing healthcare sometimes document in our uh, medical records or share information that we expect will be secure and private and only held in that one office, never mind shared across the health system. So specifically, an example would be really sensitive information about things like extramarital relationships or other things like that. And increasingly with health records being shared across the system, not widely, not openly, lots of protections around it. But I think it's important that we as individual providers and also patients who are speaking with our, our physicians or other healthcare team members articulate a point about uh, you know, what should or should not be documented if I'm telling you something, recognizing that those health records now are being shared in many different ways. And so on a more micro level, I think it is a bit of a mindset shift as clinicians. And, and another example would be things like sometimes patients uh, express frustration about another healthcare provider to a different healthcare provider. And we need to be careful not to just cavalierly document that, which then other providers might see, right? And it it can uh, label patients in, in different ways. So I think this idea of open access to healthcare and people being able to access their own health records is really important. It's leading to a democratization of information, empowering people, but it also requires a mindset shift on the part of healthcare practitioners and the way we write about our patient interactions in a responsible and, and respectful way, and also the kinds of things we document. So I think it's just reasonable for people to keep that in mind as they're visiting healthcare professionals. Thank you very much. And a question now for Dr. Aberjurindi. This one comes from Kelly Grant, who's with the Globe and Mail. Um, and it's a multi-part question. So perhaps I'll also ask uh, Dr. Park to weigh in uh, on the part about the doctor shortage. Um, so the question from the Globe and Mail is, uh, why do we need to, uh, why do we need AI to predict diabetes? Aren't the risk factors for diabetes well-known and straightforward to identify? Wouldn't any money spent on AI related projects be better spent on providing healthcare to people in a place like Peel, where one of the biggest problems patients might face is a shortage of family doctors and nurse practitioners who may actually help patients manage their health to avoid diabetes. So perhaps Dr. Aberdrindi, if you could uh, start us off. Yes, no, this is a brilliant and very valid question. 
The risk factors for diabetes are well known, but what we do know, particularly about type 2 diabetes, has evolved significantly over the last two or more decades. So now if we look at the risk factors, it's generally you're above the age of 35, you have a family history of diabetes, you have a history of gestational diabetes, you've had a child above a certain age, you're from a certain ethnicity. It's almost every and anybody right now. What AI can help us do is to efficiently get ahead of these changes at a population level in when and whom is getting diabetes or has the potential to get diabetes at whatever time point so that we can take a population level approach to managing it, right? So I, I do think that it informs better health system management. What we do is because our system has its shortfalls and is currently over, over constrained, Using an AI tool to predict who are the top 5 to 10% most at risk of developing diabetes in the next five years, right, would help us tailor and channel the limited system resources we have to prioritize prevention and personalize management approaches for those groups such that we can prevent or delay the onset of diabetes. So I think it could be a way of effectively channeling our limited resources to be able to get ahead of the increasing burden of diabetes. I'll hand over to Dr. Park. Yeah, thank you for that uh, wholesome answer. And I think the conversation, it's, it's a great question. Um, and, and I think when we are, whenever we have these conversations around technology and how they uh, interface with medicine, it's oftentimes a, uh, either or as opposed to an and. And I think this is one of those times where we really have to have careful conversations about how emerging technologies um, actually augment our, our ability to improve access, which is really the key question being asked here. Um, and, and I think that... Um, Similar to Dr. Rizak's uh, answer around risk tolerance and and where we have to we have to weigh those trade offs and uh, we you're right we can't overinvest in one technology at the at the expense of of saying that yes we absolutely recognize that we need family doctors how do we plan for that how do we develop that but how we also how do we also augment their ability to um, as Dr. Abergerandi said. Um, prevent uh, or, or capture disease early in its course and be able to manage it um, in, in a way that is, is very patient focused and gives the provider the tools that we need uh, to be able to do that more effectively and efficiently. Um, and, and I think that that's a really key point. Thanks. Thank you very much. And we have a question from Len Gillis, who's a reporter with uh, Village Media and Sudbury.com. Um, talking about AI seems to be focused on the larger hospitals in Ontario's larger cities. How can this new approach be translated to remote and rural hospitals such as those in Northern Ontario? And will this result in additional costs for Northern Ontario health facilities? Perhaps uh, Dr. Razik, if you could start us off. Yeah, this, this question is close to my heart. You know, I, I grew up in Windsor, Ontario, which is one of the more underserviced areas. It's not a, it's not a small city, but it's medium size and underserviced by many statistics of access and other quality uh, elements of care that we look at. And when we constructed, Gem when we've built Gemini up, we've, we've always kept sites like Windsor, like Sudbury in our minds because the nature of delivery of Canadian healthcare, may, you have to ensure that these technologies are not concentrated within just the large, relatively wealthy urban centers and hospitals. And so I think AI is AI and the advance of digital technologies in general can be something that flattens some of these hierarchies and access gradients if used appropriately. So this is back to, you know, I think the very good phrasing that Dr. Park said. So it's not an or question, it's an end question here. The technologies themselves can be very effective. So uh, uh, when we look at data about access to care in smaller sites across the province, across the country, communities which are system systematically excluded from some of the newer advances in technology, for example, racialized communities, we see after the fact that these gaps are significant, enormous in some to some extent. But the, the promise of these kind of technologies is not to just document after the fact, it's to see them in real time if, as they're emerging and intervene as they're emerging to reduce those gradients. And so for Sudbury, for Windsor, for a racialized community, 
if these technologies are to address the gradients that we're seeing, we have to build in the infrastructure now so that we are getting their data in real time, seeing the gradients that are emerging, addressing them before they affect people's lives. You know, I, I think the pandemic has colored a lot of our mentality towards what the future of healthcare is going to look like. The, the pandemic was a was a microcosm of these kinds of challenges in many ways. We saw enormous and disproportionate burdens in certain communities, racialized communities, rural parts of the province, in terms of access to life-saving medications for COVID-19, for severe COVID-19. But we saw these after the fact, six months later, nine months later, 12 months later, after the time that you can intervene. So these technologies in order to maximally improve the health of all Ontarians, but also to reduce these gradients, require that we make the infrastructure investments into these underserviced areas, communities. And I don't think that these communities should bear the brunt of the costs of these interventions. This is something that we centrally as a system should be investing in because we know the gradients already exist. You don't need to do another study to know that these communities are underserviced. You know that almost on every parameter you look at, they are underserviced. So the the in, the infrastructure investments have to happen now. Thank you very much. And a related question I'll get Dr. Verma to weigh in on. How will these technologies benefit rural Ontarians? What problems can these technologies cause for rural Ontarians? And will, they, will there be fewer services in these areas because the AI told planners so? Similarly, it's a it's a very important question, a, a, a critically important thing to learn and know about artificial intelligence technologies is they learn from existing patterns in our data. And uh, so what that means is that if a specific community was underserved or had less data, then the AI technology, if not if it's not designed correctly, might learn that that's appropriate and might exacerbate inequities. We've seen this uh, along race-based lines where, uh, you know, uh, communities that get less access to care, then uh, AI technology say, oh, they didn't need access to care, so it prioritizes communities that already had access to care. So we know that that is a risk latent within some AI technologies. Importantly, there are ways to mitigate those risks. One critical way to mitigate that risk is to ensure you have good data from all across the province so that our data is not just representative of the centers uh, that are the, the most well-resourced. And I think that relates to Dr. Razak's point. It's that we need to make a dedicated investment in both the core infrastructure, uh, the core digital infrastructure for these communities to ensure that that digital divide, even just access to broadband internet, for example, right? Those core enabling infrastructures are critically important, but also an investment in data so that uh, sites that are smaller are supported to collect and manage their data in a way that uh, lines up with the way the data is being collected elsewhere in the province and to be supported to share that data so that they are part of developing the tools uh, uh, that then will could serve a, a much broader range of communities. And just to that end, one of the things we are working on with Gemini is to try to include smaller, uh, more rural hospitals, uh, hospitals from different parts of the province so that we can have that more representative data so that our solutions are more applicable elsewhere. And just as an, a small example, many hospitals don't have the ability to integrate really shiny, fancy, high-powered AI tools into a fancy electronic medical record if they are a smaller hospital hospital, they don't have large IT support. So one of the things we're doing to make our tools more scalable is to create a, a parallel version that is like a web-based calculator that is a bit simpler that a clinician could use in a rural area or a different area that maybe can't in integrate it directly into their EMR and work with those sites to make sure that those tools are still user-friendly, integrate with workflow, really serve the needs of local communities. So uh, having that mindset is really important. And I think the most important thing is that we we keep that in mind at the beginning when we are designing our solutions, because otherwise, if we don't keep it in mind, it is absolutely true that uh, AI technologies may widen the digital divide. And uh, Dr. Abadurindi, would you like to weigh in on if there will be fewer services in rural areas because AI has told planners so? Yes, thank you, Emily, for that. Um, that's one of the key questions that our network solutions is trying to solve is this question of how do you use AI responsibly? 
Now there's ongoing conversations about the frameworks on responsible use of AI. We are particularly going to be developing a framework on responsible use of AI in healthcare systems. And there are a couple of principles and I just mentioned about six of them. One is there has to be transparency in how it is developed and how it is used such that it can be tested and interrogated for different populations groups under different conditions. Two, there has to be verification of the privacy and data security structure or infrastructure um, that protects the rights of patients or health systems, right? So how is the data being used? What data is informing decisions? Um, what data points are planners using to determine how much resources are flowing to a community or not? It has to be fair and ethical in the decisions that it rolls out and the way in which it uses data to inform decisions. Um, there has to be accountability of the process to certain regulations and checks and balances that have been set up. It has to be inclusive, um, to Dr. Verma's point, where are the sources of data? Who is represented in the data? Is it inclusive of the population that it's being served? So for example, it will not be inclusive, fair or ethical for data from healthcare systems in urban Ontario to be used to inform system planning in rural Ontario, for example. And I think the final principle I just wanted to highlight is that it needs to be reliable and safe um, in very different conditions. And I think that's why this journey of AI use in healthcare is an ongoing continuous journey and we're gonna keep learning while trying to live up to the principles to serve the populations that we work for. Um, thank you very much for that answer. And um, another question now, uh, I'll pose this one to Dr. Bahad Razik. This one comes from Marjo John, uh, with, she's with the Medical Post. Are there any AI applications uh, that are fully implemented right now in Ontario's healthcare system? Can you give examples and quantify their success so far? Yeah, so it is honestly just the starting point of the integration of these kinds of technologies. So I think looking for a major impact, at least in an Ontario context, we're not there yet. It's just the starting point of the implementation. There are examples. So the example that we gave, uh, that Dr. Verma gave of ChartWatch is up and running. It directly influences the care that we're providing. I, as a clinician, receive alerts from ChartWatch when I am on service. Uh, in the hospital starting tomorrow, for example, and it will change the way that I practice and see patients because of these alerts. The delirium example that we gave is actively being rolled out right now. And beyond that, many of the modern electronic health records, so you're seeing a major transition in the country and in the province to hospitals buying these brand new, very comprehensive and very technologically advanced electronic health records. For example, products made by groups like Epic or Cerner, these often have embedded AI tools that have been developed in other places of the world, developed in the United States, developed in Europe, that are embedded within the electronic health record that will give predictions to the clinicians who are using the electronic health record. The impact of these technologies, though, I think is something that we need to actively evaluate because it's not always clear if these technologies that are embedded, for example, in the EPIC systems that are being brought in, if they're going to work well within our highly multicultural population here in Ontario. So Ontario has one of the most multicultural populations of any high income country or jurisdiction. So will they work as well here? We don't know. And I think this is the part about evaluating these technologies to ensure that they advance the health of Ontarians, but also don't unintended, without intention, draw further gradients between groups that are already receiving poor healthcare quality or poor outcomes. And I'll, I'll tie this back to one of the first questions we had around the use of data and the kind of data that's missing. You know, this, this story of someone looking under a lamplight for their lost keys and, and someone comes up and asks them, why are you looking under a lamplight? And the, the answer is, well, this is where the light is. And so we need to ask with our data, where is the light? Where isn't the light? And I can say that to the disappointment of many researchers, Ontario, for example, doesn't systematically gather information in our health records about things like race, ethnicity, educational level, home situations like frailty, um, housing conditions. These are now increasingly being embedded in data sets with appropriate protections in other jurisdictions, and they allow you to ask the questions that are important as you are advancing these technologies. And again, 
as we are at the starting point, I think we also need to say where are the gaps. The gaps is this kind of information, because if we don't embed this information in now, we won't see the gradients that may emerge over the next five years as these technologies become more ubiquitous. Thank you very much for that answer. And another reporter question, I'll direct this one um, to Dr. Verma. How do you prevent medical professionals from becoming too reliant on emerging technologies to the detriment of patients? Yeah, that, that question about uh, uh, reliance on emerging technologies could have been asked at any point over the decades. How do you ask, how do you prevent a physician from becoming too reliant on their stethoscope as opposed to their ear on the chest of a patient or on a CT scan as opposed to an x-ray or an MRI? So I think any advance in technology, we don't we shouldn't be asking about reliance. We should be saying, how does this new technology enable better decision making, better patient care, right? And AI stands to do that. It also comes with downsides, so we need to think about it carefully. And importantly, and this question really raises that point, which is AI technologies um, need to be considered in the context of how the technology interacts with the human care element, the human care team. So how does it influence the workflow of care? How does it influence clinical judgment and clinical decision making, it's not always the case that more information leads to better decisions. The way the information is presented, the you know uh, type of information that's presented, etc., is really important. And so there's a lot of research to be done about the interface between humans and computer systems that is really uh, really critically important here. But I, I you know couldn't be more excited about the opportunities there. Thank you very much. Um, and another uh, reporter question. I'll ask this one first to Dr. Razik, but please, if any of the other panelists uh, would like to weigh in, um, will AI replace doctors? I mean, I think we can give an emphatic no to that. And it's it's really a question of the best partnership between new technologies, you know, drawing on what Dr. Verma just said and the delivery of patient-centered, human-centered care. So this is the critical point. Patients don't want to see an AI algorithm. The AI algorithm cannot fully understand all of the concerns of patients. The data is not there, the technology is not there. What we need to have is a system where the integration of these technologies allows patients and providers to spend that critical time together where the technology is then processing information, adding value in a way that clinicians and patients together can interpret that, that information and come to a best decision about care, about outcomes, about these critical life decisions. We do do that. So doctors in Ontario and in Canada, we are trained to integrate complex information. As Dr. Verma said, historically, it could have been an MRI report. You see something abnormal on an MRI report. You put that in context of the patient and their life and their goals, and you make a decision together. AI is just like that. And I, and I think the opportunity here is to bring in a new tier of very important technology. We don't fully, I think, at this point, realize the extent to which this technology will change the way medical practice is delivered. But to bring in that information and to integrate it into best decision making with patients. And so that is a uniquely human thing. It's a, it's, it's a relationship and a partnership between patients and their clinicians. And that's why I think AI will definitely not supplement any part of that, but hopefully it will make the decision making more informed, more accurate over time. That's the goal here. And, and a lot of what we've covered today is the responsibility of these technologies to provide information that don't without intention drive biases in the kind of decisions that will be made. So I think that is, again, the great challenge. I think clinicians in general are right at the coalface. They are the ones seeing patients. They're the ones seeing who's coming in with illness, who's coming in with severe illness that could have been treated and prevented. It's about integrating that information back into the algorithms to improve things over time. So I think there's that process as well. It's the use of the information, but it's also improving the technology. And again, that's where clinicians will have a critical role, I'm sure. Thank you. And I'm going to ask uh, OMA President Dr. Andrew Park to weigh in on if AI can replace doctors. Yeah, I think, you know, at, at the core of what we do, um, we this is a humane profession. And I think that um, th this idea that that um, technology is going to completely replace doctors, as, as Dr. Berman has said before, like we've had this discussion uh, in multiple forms and multiple iterations about multiple different technologies. I mean, you know, we, we joke about the Dr. Google concept, um, but but at the end of the day, that hasn't 
that hasn't replaced doctors. And, and I think that contextualization of patient information and how we see the patient in front of us is really critical so that we can use data to help augment how we make decisions and about the care that we provide that, that's only going to help um, provide better care, provide earlier care, provide more costly care, provide more um, equitable care. Um, and, and I think that that's, uh, that's at the core of what we do. So no, I don't see AI replacing that, that capability. You know, I think there's always a fear around um, emerging technologies that we do need to address. And, um, and I'm pleased to hear the conversation around how, how that, that, that gets uh, distributed, how it gets utilized um, in a way that, that helps people in, in certainly equity deserving groups as well. Um, and having that lens uh, to resource and resource allocation in healthcare. Um, the, the AMA president uh, had a great quote about AI where he, um, he, he said that AI won't replace doctors, but doctors who use AI will replace doctors who don't use AI. And I think that, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, like all emerging technologies, this is something that is going to be part of our infrastructure. And it's something for us to best understand and utilize in a patient centric fashion. And that's how we use AI to the best capability. Thank you very much. And a reminder to reporters that you can put questions uh, in the Q&A. Uh, just a, another reminder as we near uh, the end of our hour together here. Um, another question for Dr. Abdurindi. Your hope is that this framework developed in your current project can be used for other projects that can predict disease. So what sorts of other diseases uh, could be predicted by AI? Thanks, Emily. Um... So we do see that there's use case for the framework that we're going to develop and, you know, use of other machine learning models to predict diseases like cancer, like heart failure, like Parkinson's. And so those are the kind of use cases that we foresee this work is going to evolve into. And again, ties back to this idea of better efficient planning and use of resources in an over-constrained healthcare system. I think what is also interesting is by contextualizing the specific use of the models that our team has developed within a certain geographic region, we're also going to be able to factor in, well, what are the considerations that stakeholders, designers, developers, um, health system users, patients, and communities need to factor in in their use of AI at a population health level? So we're very excited about what the next two to three years will bring and happy to share the findings from our study as they evolve. Thank you very much. And we have a question from Elizabeth Payne. Uh, she's a health reporter with the Ottawa Citizen. Uh, I'll direct this one to uh, Dr. Verma. Are there countries that are further along in the use of artificial intelligence in medicine? And what are some of the lessons being learned? Honestly, at the country level, there are not a lot of countries that are really further along. There are specific institutions or networks of institutions that are uh, more advanced that have been leading. Uh, really, I think the story of AI and medicine right now is pockets of innovation, exciting new technologies that have yet to be scaled or implemented widely in any jurisdiction around the world. Um, there uh, is a, a group of sort of fundamental technologies. Dr. Razak uh, mentioned some that are integrated sort of predictive solutions integrated into electronic medical records. There are other tools that are increasingly being integrated into the way software uh, processes medical images, for example, um, uh, that some of that just kind of gets routinely incorporated into software packages that are used. But outside of that, in terms of real clinical facing tools, um, we're seeing large scale uh, clinical trials happening in Scandinavia, happening in uh, integrated health insurance systems in the United States. Um, but we have not really seen uh, widespread use outside of research settings implemented yet. There are some countries, especially Europe, that are on the leading edge of thinking about the regulation of AI, about the fairness and ethics related to AI. And so, you know, I think that's a really important lesson for us to learn is to, you know, we uh, thankfully to projects like what Dr. Abhijarindia is doing and other things, we really need to get our uh, thinking 
wrapped around that very quickly because these technologies are bursting into healthcare increasingly. There's been a dramatic increase in the number of AI enabled devices that are now approved by the US Food and Drug Administration for use, right? Now we're into the several hundreds, if not thousands of technologies that have been approved. And so it's only a matter of time in the coming couple of years that these things will start penetrating healthcare quickly in Canada. So from a regulatory ethics and organization health system perspective, we really need to build up our capacity to understand how to responsibly use these tools. And we're not quite there yet, but there are some leading jurisdictions in, in Europe and even in, in the US that we can learn from. Well, thank you very much uh, for that answer. And uh, another question for OMA President, uh, Dr. Andrew Park. Um, wanted to ask about uh, physician burnout. The OMA has identified physician burnout as an urgent priority that needs to be addressed. So how does technology play a role in uh, the burnout that physicians are, are facing? Yeah, it's a great question. And um, and with the explosion of electronic medical records, um, we've spent uh, more time in front of a computer than we do in front of our patients. And that's not the spirit or the philosophy of what we signed up to do as physicians. Uh, we wanna be there at the bedside with our patients. We wanna be at the clinic with our patients. Um, but but the um, the electronic medical record is really, uh, it, it's really driven us from that. Um, and I think that where AI has some great capabilities is in terms of taking mass amounts of data and, um, and, and, and tailoring them to clinical outcomes. Um, if there are capable, if there are capabilities that allow us to then take all that information from our electronic medical records, sort, categorize, and, and allow us uh, to make decisions more rapidly uh, without, without um, you know, literally going file after file after file. I think that's a tremendous amount of capabilities that puts us at the bedside. And um, administrative burden has been identified as one of the key um, key uh, contributors to physician burnout. Um, and that's something that every single physician um, in this province understands all too well. Um, and, and that would be the hope around how uh, artificial intelligence can certainly from a technological standpoint, um, aid us as clinical decision makers. Um, thank you very much. And I'm going to pass it to Fahad, uh, Dr. Fahad Razik, uh, who has some more insights on physician burnout. Yeah, I'll just add a small point to Dr. Park's answer, which I think was excellent. One of the interesting insights we've seen from Gemini about volume of, of burden of, of care provision that physicians have to experience and this issue of burnout is that the, at least in a hospital setting, the average number of patients seen by a physician or the severity of their illness has not changed very much in the last 10 years. Yet we have this issue of physicians, clinicians expressing that idea of burnout, of volume, of complexity. And what we see when we look at the data is other things about information have changed dramatically. So for example, the number of words in an imaging report that a physician has to read has gone up by 20%. The number of medication and medication adverse events that they have to consider has gone up considerably. This again tells you about the promise of information of information processing, simplifying potential of AI in reducing the perceived burden that we are feeling as clinicians, processing that larger volume of information that we now need to process, simplifying it, allowing us to continue with that patient-centered care. So I think it's a really critical opportunity for AI to process all of this huge volume of information. People have drawn a comparison of drinking from a fire hose to try and constrain that and process it for us. Thank you very much. And thank you to all the panelists. Uh, OMA President Dr. Andrew Park has some closing remarks. Um, thank you, Dr. Herizak, Dr. Abergerindi, Dr. Verma. Um, and thank you to all of uh, the media for attending today's briefing and for your thoughtful questions. As you've heard today, the integration of artificial intelligence into Ontario's healthcare system could be a game changer. It has the potential to transform the way we detect and treat diseases, predict patient complications, and manage healthcare resources. Though early detection of diseases and complications, uh, sorry, through early detection in, of diseases and complications, we can save more lives. And by optimizing resource allocation, we can make our healthcare system more efficient and resilient. As we continue to understand AI and its capabilities, we can look forward to even more breakthroughs in healthcare, ensuring that Ontarians receive the best care possible. As doctors, we always want what is best for our patients. We know there are cracks and we need to fix in the healthcare system now. 
The OMA is a roadmap for the future in our prescription for Ontario doctor's five-point plan for better health care. Thank you, everyone, for your time.